My name is Craig Nzoro. I'm part of the PC for the Ghost Conferences. With me today, I have Phil and Feynman. Um, my name is Feynman. I have cur I'm currently a PhD student. Um, I left my job as Director of Engineering at Gigster, and prior to that, I was um, a master's student at the University of Cambridge working on machine learning. And hi, my name is Phil Winder, and I run a small data science consultancy in the UK. And we work with companies, big and small, to help them extract value from their data um, and to implement data-oriented applications and, and processes. Uh, yeah, my background is uh, a general engineering one. I started in electronics, moved into software, and then into to data science and, and AI. And that is the reason why we brought the two of you together, because your field of um, work expertise is about data science, machine learning. Um, I guess many of us have a hard time defining what is data science, what is machine learning, what is AI. Could you help me draw these lines? I mean, these terms, I, I do hear them thrown around quite a bit. Um, for me, at least, uh, data science was originated by Jeff Hammerbacher and his co colleagues at Facebook um, back when there was a missing role between analysts and engineers. And they needed someone who could dive deep into the data that was being built by these production systems and created. And that needed more sophisticated processing than a SQL analyst or an Excel analyst could produce. Um, with respect to machine learning, um, I really define machine learning as learning from data or systems that learn from data over time. So oftentimes, so this definitely requires large pools of data. You can't do machine learning without data. And moreover, it requires algorithms that um, draw from optimization and control theory that improve as more data comes in, and it's able to draw conclusions and patterns over that data over time. And AI, I really view as kind of this the overarching or general term that describes um, well artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, it really talks about it's really covering this idea of systems that are more intelligent that can do things that are not just you know zero one logic. Rather, it's fairly fuzzy. Um, the tasks are less well defined, but nevertheless, we expect these machines to perform almost on par with humans. Yeah, I, t I tend to agree with with, with all of that. Um, you got to remember that that these fields are not accredited in any way. So, you, if if you say you're a civil engineer um, or you're a, an accredited uh, electronic engineer, that means a very specific thing according to the uh, the certification of those accrediting unions. Um, but, but software engineering, data science, you know, it's not that mature and these things are, are evolving up over time. So they, the, the definitions of these fields are kind of de developed by the people doing them. So in, in my opinion, I, I kind of see, see data science as this overarching uh, thing, you know, working, doing science with data, working with data. And, that, and, and, a, and a subset of that is machine learning, you know, trying to teach machines to make decisions um, based upon data. Um, but there's also lots of other stuff like the exploratory data analysis and, and, and things like that that are not consumed within within machine learning itself. And then and then AI, I kind of I, I tend to see that as a bit more of a, a an academic, a philosophical discipline. Um, it's it, the, the idea of whether we can, um, you know, I mean, it's been around for for well since like Alan Turing, so like since since the 1950s. Can we build something artificial that um, acts and, and mimics and thinks um, like, I don't want to say thinks like a human, but appears to think like a human and acts like a human, behave like a human, um, but in, from an artificial uh, construct, whether that be software or electronics or quantum computing or, or, or anything like that. Um, so it, I think it's really hard to pin down what AI really is, but obviously the, the, the marketing guys really look like the, the word AI. And uh, it's a really interesting philosophical field, I think, for, for the people trying to define and, uh, yeah, and, and to, try, to, to try and find where the boundary is, really. Like, at what point do you become um, more intelligent than a human? Does it have to be in a, a specific task? Can it be in a specific task? Or does it have to be more general than that? Um, so that's kind of where the, the field is going. It's like these expert systems have, have done very well in very narrow fields. So the question is, can we kind of expand that field now to to cover more of the more of the human psyche? I think a big issue in this is that the way I see it, at least.
today when we're dealing with machine learning, or if we call it AI, we still have to do a lot of pre-processing of the data. We have to prepare it for the machine. Basically, we have to understand it first because we can hand it over to the machine. Is that true? And if, how far can we actually go? If there still needs to be a human mind behind it? Yeah, so I'll take the first then. So it's sort of several questions buried within that one question, really. Um, so from, from a very practical perspective, um, pre-processing and cleaning your data is, is vitally important for, um, you know, uh, application projects where you're trying to apply data science or apply machine learning to a, sp a, a particular problem. And there's, there's a, a couple of reasons for that. The first reason is that most of the models that are used in production data science systems today expect your data to be in a very specific format. Um, the vast majority of algorithms all expect your data to be normally distributed, to have a fixed scale, um, to not be correlated with each other. All of these requirements um, are needed so that the, the algorithm can, can do its job. Um, if you don't do that, then sort of the, the best case is that it just doesn't perform quite as well as it could. Sometimes it can just completely fail and it won't, it won't work at all. So there's a very practical reason to do data cleaning. Um, the, the, the second point, and it's kind of, it, people forget about this a lot actually, is that the, the, the practice of looking at the data, visualizing the data, analyzing the data, to clean the data, often throws up new insights and new ideas and new questions even. Because like quite often I've, I've had times where I've been doing the data cleaning, I'm looking at some particular features and I'm like, what's going on there? That's, that's really interesting. And that's led to a, a new insight, a new idea for a particular project. And that's then, you know, that, that helps the clients because they, they might not have thought of doing that thing. So, yeah, it's part, you know, it's pra very practical. You need to do it in order to gain performance. And also you need to do it for understanding and uh, new insights as well. Yeah, yeah I, I really do agree with Phil. Um, I mean, Phil mentions um, the necessity of it for algorithms to perform, as well as um, possibly like the learning and discovery process I mean, what does it mean for data to be clean? Um, for example, if you see outliers on a certain feature, are those actually outliers? Or is that a very strong signal for your algorithm? Um, just defining what it means for this data to be clean, that this data is not corrupted, um, that's, that in itself is specifying you know, what your assumptions for your, mod for your modeling domain. So I think through cleaning, you're able to discover and define you know, what do I expect, um, what, what does my domain look like, what is natural, what is not natural. Um, I do think that um, data cleaning itself is, we're seeing more and more automation with it. Um, so for example, Google has released a tool called Cloud Data Prep, and this tool is specifically designed to help do um, numerous tasks such as outlier detection, um, scaling the data so that it's between um, 0 and 1 or normally distributed, uh, whitening the data so decorrelating it. And these processes are very important for certain algorithms to succeed. Um, without, without this, um, you're going to get fairly crazy results. You keep talking about algorithms. To me, that is like a sequence of steps you need to do with your data. I might be wrong, but it also sounds to me like this is very far away from creativity. Can a computer be creative? Um, well, just to go back to like the previous point and sort of link the two questions together, you also asked, you also asked if we need to do this much data cleaning, is it ever possible to um, get to a point where the machine can do it itself? And, and more advanced algorithms these days, i.e. neural network based algorithms, are attempting to automate much of the, the feature engineering and to a degree the data cleaning process, not, not all of it, because obviously they still expect data to be like, you know, between plus and minus one and things like that. Um, but uh, they, they are very, very capable of extracting features by themselves given a uh, reward that makes sense for the problem um, that you're trying to solve. So, so, so in the future, I, I expect to see people kind of leveraging that a lot more, especially with complex data types, because when we talk about data cleaning, all the examples we keep, we keep using are always very simple, you know, sort of one dimensional, you know, features that don't really affect any other features. And it's very easy to comprehend. But in, in, in many applications, you have you know, millions of features that you can't possibly analyze by hand. 
Um, and, and so you have to rely on these, these more uh, um, cognitive systems to be able to, to learn representations of that data that, that better explain the domain. I really like um, your point about data representation. Um, so in, in theoretical computer science, um, one learns that um, some problems which are hard when represented in certain ways become easy when you expand the representation. Um, and I think the same is true um, in data science where um, if you are good with your feature engineering, then something simple like a linear model might be enough for you to solve your tasks. But if the features are poorly engineered, then there's no way for you to separate two classes with a linear decision boundary. Yeah, the, the classic example there is, is having something and going from like a Cartesian to, to polar coordinates when mm -hmm. you've got like the two concentric circles. Like just the switch of coordinate system just makes it from a really complex uh, uh, problem into a very simple, yeah, linear, linear one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but tying that to the, the question about um, can computers be creative, um, well, uh, shameless plug for my talk later today if, um, you are, if you're tuning into this. Um, You'll notice that uh, in that in my talk, I talk almost half of the talk is about data pre-processing and injecting domain knowledge, you know, my knowledge about music, um, as well as my collaborators' knowledge about music, into the representation, and then running a fairly simple generic algorithm on top of it to just model the sequences. Um, you know, I, I actually don't know how you'd be able to just take music. Uh, well, you'd have to take the music and represent it on a computer in the first place. And just that process right there, you're injecting in human knowledge and human creativity on how, how do I take music, represent it in a way that's understandable to a computer that a computer can compute on top of. Yeah, I mean, the definition of creativity is, is difficult as well, because mm -hmm. when you say creativity, you, you usually think of music, of art, of things like that. And they, they themselves are working with, within a very constrained context, like, like your examples, your back examples, you know, there's a very constrained rules of what makes it sound like back and what, what, what doesn't sound like back. Um, if you're an artist, you often paint to a specific form of, of artistry. Um, and you've got to remember that, that all of the, the sort of current and probably future AI systems are, are, are only as good as the data that you pass into it. So if, if you provide your algorithm with lots of examples of a specific type of art form, it could be very creative in that specific art form. But I mean, the, 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 the point that we haven't quite got to yet is, is, the, the hum, is, is to match the human ability um, of, of going from one creative medium into a completely different creative medium that, that appears like entirely disconnected, like going from, from, from a visual art to a musical art, for example. Mm. Um, but, but in the future, if we can, you know, if we can tra transfer that learning from one domain into another, then it might influence something else um, entirely. Uh, trying to give like an example. So as an example, if you could take like Van Gogh's paintings, like what would that sound like if you took the learning from his paintings and applied it to a, a, a musical algorithm? Would, what would it sound like? Would it sound, uh, yeah. I'm not sure, he wouldn't be able to hear it very well though. That's the, the problem with that example, but <laughs> anyway. During this conversation, I drift a bit between, okay, so you mean that we are actually pretty close to having truly smart AI and the other pole is, it sounds like we're very far away from actually having truly smart or general AI. Yes. Are we on the road towards it? Will it come? Problems in AI and their difficulty is actually um, fairly counterintuitive. Um, so, for, so the example I really like to use here is um, playing chess with Garry Kasparov. Um, AI has been able to beat Garry Kasparov before 2000. Um, however, picking up the piece and moving the pawn um, is still an unsolved problem. Um, just grass mechanics and the control systems and algorithms needed to do that is still a research problem in AI, which for humans it's very easy to move a piece, but most of us probably can't be Gary. Um, would we call this AI smart? I, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. He's, he's going back to that, that idea of designing an expert system. And, and, and the reason why that occurs is because of the, the, the way we do data science. So generally the way it works is we take the data and then try and find an, a hypothesis or a model that fits that data. So your expert system is only going to be an expert in, in, in the data that you provide. Um, we, we, if, you want, if you want 
to have a solution to more general problems, then you need to provide it in this general context and this general data. Um, and I think that will that will happen because these, these these algorithms are becoming more and more capable over time. It's just the the applications that, that you know the low hanging fruit of the, the 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 applications that could be derived from these algorithms are all being picked off first. So I'm, I'm sure. So I'm getting very involved and interested in reinforcement learning, and it's it's very similar to supervised learning except that you're you're changing the the definition of the reward. You you, you actually provide a reward signal rather than. Uh, uh, supervised uh, corrections saying like yes that was right or no that was wrong and so the the beauty of this type of algorithm is that we're not technically telling it how to do its job it kind of learns how to do its job itself so so using algorithms like this in in a, a wider range of diverse applications than um, uh, more diverse applications I think this will spawn more general AI than it is now but it'll still be never, I, I still think it won't be ever, you know, purely general AI for a long time. So it will still, it will remain a tool for me in my daily work. It will not take over my job. Yeah, so I mean, industries are all being affected in slightly different ways. Um, uh, it, it depends on the job and it, it depends on the, the, the tasks that people are doing in that job. Um, I, I feel like, so I've got a, a, an example from a project at the moment where we are helping a company with a, a, a like a condition monitoring problem, and at the moment there's lots of people that go around, you know, they travel for for, for many many miles to do this condition monitoring manually, and um, uh, what we're trying to do is instead of just like replacing what they do we are attempting to do the same job but remotely. So those people will still be needed, it just makes their job a lot easier to do. It's, it's not necessarily taking over their job, it's helping them do their job more efficiently. And that's, that's really the goal. Yeah, um, I, I, I agree. I think that um, it, it's highly dependent on um, which industry you're in, what role you're in. Um, there's been quite a bit of discussion about um, how autonomous driving is going to take over the trucking industries and um, the trucking and the truckers will need to be retooled into doing some more specific, into doing other work. Um, and you may see you may see similar um, trends in uh, low skilled labor as well, um, where machines are quite capable of automating a task that's currently being seen by humans. Um, however, one one uh, ethical question that comes along is um, if a machine makes a mistake, who's who's at fault? Is it the algorithm's fault, um, or is it? Uh, like, who do we blame? Who do we file the lawsuit against? Um, with a human worker, it's, there's no ambiguity here. So um, for certain tasks where you do need responsibility, you do need accountability, I think like humans are still necessary. Oh, the future still looks bright. <laughs> if you want to be a lawsuit target. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.